uh, design school program for the summer. And I learned everything. I learned drafting and we were in a landmark building. So we were learning about the, the trim details and the columns and it was all so exciting. And I, I felt at home, you know, I felt like I had found what I was supposed to do and nothing else had resonated with me in a way that this had. So I just jumped in. I transferred schools. I transferred cities. I made a career change and I dove all in um, because that is, I think the kind of person that I am, I'm, if I feel something, I know that it's right. And I make that decision. I don't weigh pros and cons for good or for bad. I just like, this is what I'm going to do. So years later, I graduated with my bachelor's in interior design and I was looking for jobs. And as people do when they're in school and they're young, you think you have a sort of path. And I thought my path was commercial interior design. So I looked for firms that could offer me that experience. And I found an amazing women owned firm in Manhattan. Uh, Cause I was in Philadelphia school was in Philadelphia. So I wanted to move back. I wanted to move to Manhattan. Um, they started their firm when they were 25. They were two strong and independent and talented women. I'm still very close with them today. And because they are a boutique firm, I knew that I could gain lots of experience. So I jumped in with them. We did a little bit of hospitality design. We did corporate office design for some of the biggest financial offices in New York City. You know that we are a financial hub. So we got to work with great companies and great people. Uh, we did a lot of healthcare, which was fun. Um, I got to learn a lot of things uh, about stain resistant fabrics, which is something I never thought I would know about. Um, I did educational work. That was great. You got to design schools for little people and then big people, you know, like small little children and then teenagers and how they use the rooms differently and what needs to be uh, flexible for both. Um, we did so much with them. And what I really love is because I was working with the two principals directly, I got to see how they did their bookkeeping. I got to see how they did HR. I was HR sometimes because there was only four of us. You know, I got to see how they managed client issues, which occur so much and the finesse in which you need to have to speak to people. Um, I got to learn how to speak to corporate clients. And if I was at a large firm, there is no way I would be in those client meetings, right? It's me, my two principals and a board boardroom full of heavy hitters. And I got to sit through negotiations and presentations. And I really feel that this firm set me up to be able to actually run my own firm um, because I got to do all the ins and outs. Also organization. This firm was so organized. I'm not as organized as them. I wish I was, but you know, everything was numbered and color coded and there were no mistakes. It was amazing. So I had many years there. And then I started to think that I should um, try my hand at residential interior design. And when I graduated school, I thought that would be silly. I never thought I was going to do that, you know? So I got the opportunity to work with an amazing interior designer, Vincent Wolf. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with him, but he is like the top in the country, one of the tops in the country. He's been Architectural Digest, um, AD100, El Decor A-list, uh, featured everywhere, won sorts of awards. Uh, with him, I did projects abroad as well, Sweden and Switzerland. Uh, so I had a lot of amazing experience with him. He is a very intuitive person. So working with him, I learned to trust my intuition. And I think that's a hard thing for a lot of people to learn. I don't know a lot of people that um, innately trust, trust themselves because of, you know, things growing up, we're always told to do things a certain way or not to listen to your gut but he is an intuitive interior designer. So I learned to trust my gut. Um, I learned how he approached his signature look. 
And I also had a design blog at the time that was, you know, took me to design events all over the world. I was in Finland. I was in Germany. It was amazing. And through both of those experiences, I learned how to hone my design eye. I learned that I wanted to have a signature look and a signature point of view because I didn't want to just be a designer that comes into the world and does whatever somebody wants and then moves on, right? I want to be known for something and I want to give people something specific. So all of these experiences culminated in me forming Tina Ramchin the Nani Creative in 2014. And I, now six and a half years, like I said, I focused on my look, the soulful minimal look, it took me a little while to get the name and everything else followed. So the business experience followed, figuring out how to hire, figuring out how to manage projects, all of that followed, but I never wavered on my signature look. So that is how I got here. I don't know if we want to step for questions here or if I should move on to some of my work. Um, I think we could see some of your work if that's all right with you. And then yeah. we can have questions after that. Let me try to share screen. Gonna present and then tell me. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Okay. I have lots of notes here. So each of my homes, like I said, soulful minimalism. For me, it is creating homes that my clients can live in. They will be surrounded by the things that matter to them so that they can focus on the people that matter. I want the homes to represent me and them at the same time. My point of view with their vision, and we'll get into vision a little bit later on how I pull the vision out of them, but I'll go through some of these and what our beginning vision was and how we came to the end result. So, nope. Ah, okay. So this is a master suite, a master lounge suite that we did in Soho. So this was actually a show house, which was really cool because I don't know if many of you are familiar, but when you do a show house, you basically get to pick your theme and pick your look and you don't have a client. So it's really cool because you're thinking outside of the box, but it's also really hard because there are no restrictions. So you kind of have to figure out your own restrictions. So this master suite, instead of doing just a typical bed and, you know, there were bedrooms all over the house, I wanted to create a master lounge. I walked into this space. I was, it was all white. It was beautifully done, but it was kind of a gloomy day outside. And I only had 10 days to complete this, this space. Okay. Because we were on a tight deadline. I immediately thought of twilight that amazing time of day when day turns into night and you have like different colors in the sky and it's a lot of blues turning to dark blues to black you know that was what i was feeling when i walked into the space and i wanted to have the viewer be able to sit or stand in each area of the room and have a completely different experience I wanted you to be able to stand in one corner and look at everything else and not feel like you're getting the same view in another corner. Uh, so we decided to do ombre. So we decided to do one color, you know, moving on to the next color, dark to light. But instead of the typical ombre where you have up and down, you know, ceiling to floor, I decided to do it from one side of the room all the way to the next, continuing into the hallway. And we took that color on the ceiling as well. So really, anywhere you look, you have a different point of view. It was really interesting. It was, the photographs don't do this justice. I still love the photographs, but being in this room, you could feel the emotion. You could feel the twilight. You could feel that it was a nice after work, relaxing room with the excitement of night to come. So this is the happiest hour in Soho, and that was my vision. This one is in Quag. 
Uh, this, I think you may see, if you go to my website, it may be one of the first ones. Um, I'm really proud of this project. I did this in, uh, it's in the Hamptons. Uh, Quag is on the Quantuck Bay. I did it with a friend of mine who lives out East. She was my work wife at Vincent Wolf. So we were really excited to do this together. This client, I knew him very well. And he came to us with the vision. He said he wanted to have a Manhattan feel in the Hamptons. And if anyone knows anything about Hamptons design, usually it's much more beachy, a lot more loose. This is much more refined. It feels like you're sitting in a Manhattan living room. Usually in a Hamptons house, there's more stripes and linens and, you know, it's just, it's just more casual. Um, he already knew he wanted gray as his theme. So he was going for Manhattan. So we worked closely with the architect and the builder and we decided to give him the exterior of a Hamptons home. So it matched all of his neighbor's homes. We had the shingles, but when you walk in, it felt incredible. We mixed so many materials to give this, uh, to, to give us this Manhattan look. We have gray floors, we have stainless steel countertops. We have glass on the, on the stair rails. We have concrete on the fireplace walls. Let me see if this next picture concrete, that whole fireplace wall is concrete, you know, and we warmed it up with this like 17 foot wood table. But I will say, and you can see, I don't even see my mouse. You can see the wooden metal and the glass up here too. So we really pulled this vision through, through each element of the home. Um, so I'm really proud of this house. I think it's wonderful. This one was my old apartment that I'm really very sad that we're not living in right now. We have um, upgraded to a new apartment that we'll be renovating soon. When I designed this apartment, I had recently visited Scandinavia. So I was on a design tour. I think I was in Finland. Um, and I was so taken by the stark contrast of black and white. I always loved black, but I loved the black against the very white white and how much of a pop that was. Um, and I was also taken by the gray floors because of my previous project. So I was still in that mode. Um, and some people found this home to be too minimal, but for me, it was just perfect. I work with other people's homes and colors all day long. I wanted to come home to a place that felt like a serene calming environment after doing other people's colors and furniture all day long. So that was really my inspiration by of this home. And I feel that we did pull it through. This home was used for many other stagings and shoots later on, but this was the original photo shoot. I don't know if I have bedrooms in here. Ah, okay. So we have the kitchen which is a poke and pull kitchen. Um, and again, I wanted it to be white and bright. And because we knew we weren't gonna stay here forever, we wanted it also to be approachable to anyone else that may buy it, which is why we did this white kitchen. I do like white, like white kitchens. It's great for me to look at samples on, so a little bias. And I like serving cocktails in white kitchens. There you go. Um, this is our bedroom, nice serene room, blackout curtains. But again, it's really calming and that's, in New York City, I feel like that's what everybody needs. This was staged in my home. This is a really fun photo shoot. Um, we did a collaboration with Sotheby's, Sotheby's Auction House. So Sotheby's was looking for a way to highlight their old master paintings that were sort of getting lost in today's world. All uh, young and new art collectors are looking for modern art. They're looking for a Damien Hirst. They're looking for a Banksy. And unfortunately, these old master paintings were losing their value and losing their interest. So they had an amazing idea to work with a modern interior designer and highlight their old masters in a modern setting was thrilled to be chosen. I mean, this is incredible art. We had a really cool viewing at Sotheby's in their blue room. I got to sit on a sofa and they hung all of the art in front of me. And I mean, it was incredible. Um, but we had to come up with an interesting way to do this. 
because the art is so amazing. I did not want to let the art down. So I went to my uh, incredible friends at FAIR. They are a showroom here in New York City at the New York Design Center. They have all of this furniture that you see in front of us. Uh, I asked to borrow a lot, like almost everything. And we got rugs from Crosby Street that I work with often. And I did the styling and we had supporting art from a company called Sugarlift. They have young, youthful, modern artists. So you can see that off onto the side there. And we just played around with it. And we got eight, uh, eight pieces of art highlighted. They were in the January catalog and we got to attend the January auction and it was amazing. And what I learned from this was that nothing can beat history in your modern home. I mean, now I push my clients to think outside of the box because many, many of them only want new. I really try to get them to reuse something that is theirs, uh, reupholster it. We find vintage finds on sites like First Dibs, or we go to the flea market and we find things just to add layers of interest to their home. This was a, an incredible experience. Now I'm gonna show you two spaces in the same building, 160 Leroy. Um, they're two very different clients. And it's interesting because I got both clients at the same time in the same building, uh, but they were on opposite sides. So one is in the North Tower and one is in the South Tower. This client is out of state. They are originally from Manhattan or from Brooklyn. They're from New York City but they live out of state now and they needed a Manhattan location because the husband was traveling here for work multiple times a month. Um, obviously times have changed. Um, but when he was traveling here, they really wanted it to feel like a home for him, you know, not just a random apartment because he was spending so much of his life here. Um, and then there would be months at a time where he wasn't here. So we had to make it really easy and functional to use. Uh, one of the first things that they acquired was this custom Statue of Liberty art piece, um, which is actually made of keyboard keys, like typewriter keys, um, which you can't really see from afar, but when you get up close, it's absolutely incredible. And there is a message written to them in there so you can get up close and find it. And that served as our vision, right? So we had this New York City feel with New York City skylines and an undulating building. So we picked this chandelier to go with the undulating building to feel like we had movement. We also did a curved sofa to again, move with the movement, but yet still so neutral and serene so that the skyline could shine and this piece of art could shine. Here we go, here's the other side of that room. So you can see that. Um, so their vision was very clear from the beginning. And I think that we, I think that we follow their vision very clearly and they're really thrilled. And it's so different from the next home that I'm gonna show you in the same building. So this client, um, another amazing client, they came to us from Puerto Rico and this is their pied -a -terre. So unlike the previous client that was coming in often and you know using it as their home base while he went to work, uh, this client was purely using the space for entertaining because they live in Puerto Rico, they have thriving careers in Puerto Rico, but they love coming to Manhattan and going to see Broadway shows and eating at our amazing restaurants and having cocktails with friends. They have friends in the neighborhood. So we needed a space that could easily entertain four to six people for a cocktail before going to dinner, you know, or where the couple could sit and relax before going to their play. This is not a permanent home. This is a pied-a-terre home that serves a specific function and we designed it for that function. But the vision came to us before we even started working together because they were in town for literally one day and they asked me to meet them. And I wasn't sure how this was gonna work because they weren't coming back for several months. So I kind of put together a little presentation and I brought my agreement and I went over everything with them. And one of the first images that we both showed each other, it was the same image, was a living room with these cognac leather lounge chairs. Since we both had that on our boards when we met, 
that was our inspiration. So we took that cognac color and spread it through the house. It's still neutral and serene, but you can see cognac in the dining chairs. You can see it in the flowers and in the pillows in the back. And then we took cognac and toned it down into like kind of a khaki color for the bedroom. So the color continues, but it just continues in a softer way. I don't know if I have the, there you go. Um, so you can see how it's still all kind of working together. And that was our vision and that's how we pulled it through. And this last house that I'm gonna show you before we open it up to questions is this house in Millington, New Jersey. So this was a really fun family home. Um, we, I've known this client also for a really long time and they came to us with half of their vision. He likes modern and she likes country. So the idea was how do we pair these two looks that typically don't have a lot to do with each other into one home cohesively and we did that by asking lots of questions uh, and understanding each partner's tolerance levels for how modern can we go and how country can we go. And we came up with this beautiful home. Um, the exterior of the home is a beautiful green like sage color. So we use that as our unifying base palette. You don't see it here, but we have greens that turn to blues throughout the rest of the house. And on top of that, we were able to mix styles. So here you have some of the green in the art. This is our dining chairs, uh, our, dining our casual dining table. We also have a formal dining table and be believe those are it for that. So this is, these are a few examples of how I bring soulful minimalism into my clients' homes and how I work on their vision and carry it through the homes. So I'll take some questions and then later we'll go into vision. Perfect. Thank you so much. I, oh I enjoy looking at all those designs. So it's just, uh, I don't know. I, yeah, no, I'm I so love it. I'm <laughs> okay, so it's question time already. Um, I saw yeah. that one of you have raised your hands from the audience, but unfortunately that uh, I think expires after some time. So if you can raise your hand again, that would be great. Uh, Tina, could you stop uh, sharing your, or yeah, I can stop it for yes. you. Okay, so uh, hopefully um, all the viewers can, can see you and, and, and probably us as well. Okay, so let us go through the first question. Um, so Nora has asked, um, hi, I would like to ask some questions. What was the hardest point in your career and how did you defeat it? Um, I think we can go question by question because I can see that you asked quite a lot. So, okay, so the hardest point in your career. That's, um, a that's a big one. I don't know what the exact hardest point is, but I will say that there are many difficult points. Um, I, I think every small business is like this, right? Like where we're constantly encountering a hump and then learning how to get over it. And then you grow and then there's a bigger hump. Um, so I don't have a specific difficult example, but I will say I have an amazing support system. Um, in addition to, of course, my husband and my family, I have a lot of advisors. So I have an interior design coach that I love working with. I have a mastermind group that is, you know, my love where we feel like we're family. Um, and I'm part of another group of, of women entrepreneurs that are not interior designers, but they have similar struggles that are, you know, their career related to their careers. So I think just having people that are thoughtful and are trying to grow their own businesses around you is really helpful because honestly, aside from the typical issue of like, we ran out of wallpaper, all the issues are the same, right? It's client related, it's HR related, it's hiring, it's it's business planning. So ha I, I think support yourself by a, a, with amazing people and you'll get through anything. Perfect. Okay, so the next question is, what keeps you motivated and how do you get inspiration? So um, I have to keep myself motivated. <laughs> And there are definitely days where I'm not feeling motivated, but I think um, you have to 
this is my business. So if I don't do this, who's going to do it? Right. So even on the off days, like I'm still working, I'm still like, there's always something that you can do. If you don't feel like doing one task, you can still do another task. Um, but I'm motivated because I have, you know, kind, really kind clients, um, that trust me and that, you know, appreciate me. So I want to do my best for them. So that's one. Um, and what is inspiring? I'm, I was going to talk about this later, but I think you can find inspiration anywhere. I think it's really hard right now because we used to say that travel was our inspiration, you know, and that's obviously gone out the window. Um, but it's really how you choose to view the things around you. If you even take like an hour for a museum uh, visit, it's how you choose to take in the pieces and take the tidbits and probably use them later on a different project or something like that. Um, I think inspiration is just how you view the world. And if you stay open to ideas and suggestions, I think that you can stay inspired. I love that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the next question is, uh, what do you think, what was the most successful project you have done so far? Oh, um, uh, it's hard if I guess, how do we rank success? Right. Um, I love that quag house because it was the first ground up construction we did on, like I did on my own after leaving, you know, my previous firms and it was a learning experience and the client was thrilled. So that was amazingly successful. Um, and I'll never, I, it holds a special place in my heart for me. Um, the second 160 Leroy, the one with the cognac got accolades on top of accolades. Um, I released it to the press in 2019 and we won like three awards that year. So if, if you're measuring success, then that is a great way to measure success. But I think at the end of the day, um, that's external success. So internally is really just that my clients are happy and that we had a great time together when we were doing it exactly okay and the last question from Nora was how do you see the future like in five years time for you and she thinks that she could ask questions from you <laughs> <laughs> um well I've been doing a lot of uh future work thinking and future planning so I don't know if it's in five years or it longer like 10 years but I definitely would like to have a larger uh, presence, a larger firm and a larger presence. I am not looking to be famous in any way, but I want to be able to provide some sort of assistance to, to people in a, in a bigger way, right? Like, cause I love what I do for my individual clients, but that's me like one-to-one. -one. So I'm, I've been trying to figure out how do I give back to people in a, in a bigger way. So I think in the five to 10 years, we will have figured that out and we are expanding just generally. We're in the process of hiring because we are quite busy. Um, so I think we're, we're just growing. Great. Okay. So I think we have time for one more question and then in the next question round, we'll get to the, to the yeah. rest. So Tomas asked, hi, Tina, what was it that made you want to start your own design firm? So um, I think I had said in the beginning that I listened to my intuition quite a bit and I had an amazing relationship with Vincent. We're still actually friendly. Um, you know, before COVID, we were seeing each other quite a bit. I only left because I felt in my heart that it was time to leave. You know, um, I did not want to work for another designer after working for him. I felt like I had been working for the best. I was, I'm still in awe of him, um, but that's his firm. And I think I had reached a point where um, I, I can't kind of grow any further. You know, I, you know, we were all managing our own projects. I was managing like seven projects at a time by myself. So you know, how do I, how do I continue my life without feeling stagnant? And I think it was just time to, to start my own firm. So it was really uh, very much just a gut reaction. And I think if I knew how hard it was, I would have hesitated a little bit more before doing it. But I'm glad I didn't know because I'm really happy. 
Oh, okay. So great. Um, I think then we would uh, continue with the uh, with uh, the presentation or you know the, the talk, and and yeah. then we have, have more time for the questions. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk about vision. So I know that that's sort of what we were planning for today. Um, I have sort of touched upon it previously, but the big question for me is how do you define and create vision for your clients? So, um, for me, I think that every designer should go into a project with a vision in mind uh, or creating a vision. And I don't think it's just interiors. I think it's fashion. I think it's, you know, every kind of uh, design when you're creating something, you need a starting point. Um, how we all come to that is a different way. So how I come to that is I uh, do a design discovery meeting after we sign our agreement and we're ready to work together and we have our, you know, we send little gifts and we, you know, all the fun stuff is happening and we set our design discovery meeting. You know, last year we would do this in person over wine and like cheese. This year uh, we are still doing that with some clients, but a lot of it is on Zoom with sharing screen. We ask a series of questions on how this client is planning to live in their new home, how they're currently living in their new home, in their existing home, and what are the changes that they expect. Um, we ask a lot of questions. It's kind of like a first date, and it's it's like a kind of intense, weird first date because I'm probing. Um, I ask, what do they keep on their nightstands? Do you need storage? Are you messy? You know, do we need to hide stuff? Do you need enough, a big enough nightstand for your glass or pitcher of water? Or is it gonna be stacked with books? What kind of lighting do you need? Do you need like an articulating light because you're gonna read in bed or do you want just like a whole overhead light? or do not read in bed and you're on your iPad, you know, these are really detailed things to know. And it seems a little bit invasive, but if I don't know this, I don't know how to plan lighting for them, right? What do you do when you walk in your home? Do you throw your bag on a chair or are you amazing and much more put together than me and put your jacket in the closet, right? Um, so we have to ask a lot of these questions. I also ask them a lot of whys, you know, why are you doing it that way? Maybe there's a better way. Um, is it just cause you're only used to doing it this way that, that you've not thought of another way? We do a visual interview where I ask the client to show me many images that inspire them. Uh, I put together a deck of images and we share screen and we talk about what they like and what they don't like about each image. I ask them why they like it or why they don't like it. Because again, that helps me understand what they really want. Um, I will say, Okay, something happened. I think I have no idea what. <laughs> okay, I'll just see. Um, okay, so it's a technical break then. Uh, <laughs> um, something might have happened to her internet connection. Um, okay. She has to sign in to Zoom. Okay, so probably this is the, the nightmare whenever you're planning uh, an online event, uh, but, <laughs> but we're, gonna, we're gonna get through it and hopefully Tina will be back with us in, in a short time. Um, until then, I think I'll just, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just doing some, some technical stuff until then, trying to get her back into the meeting <laughs> okay so mm -hmm. uh -huh. okay but then she is back in the in the meeting. Okay.
Um, just uh, a minute. Okay. Oh, yeah. Maybe she's back. Tina, are you? Ah, thank God. Okay. So sorry. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> God. Okay, the whole the whole thing just shut down, but my computer's fully charged. So, I I'm yeah, sorry. that's all right. Okay, <sighs> okay. <laughs> Should we just pick up where we left off? Exactly. Right. Okay. Right. Really. <laughs> so, um, again, terribly, terribly sorry. I think we were talking about the design discovery meeting and the visual interview, right? So, I will say that. Um, during the visual interview, I show several pictures, I look at their pictures, and I really need to know from them why they like something more than just it looks great, right? Is it the color palette? Is it the sofa arms? Is it the art on the walls? Do you like the rug? So this is a very long meeting. We're, we're asking things in detail because in order for me to fully design and fully understand this client, um, I need to know everything about them. And it's, it's intense, you know, it's definitely two hours. If I can stay with them longer, I will. Um, so that's our design discovery meeting. Then I regroup, I write down all of my notes because I'm scribbling everywhere. And usually I have a designer with me and she's taking like better notes. Um, but I have my own like mental way of doing things. So I regroup, I write my notes down either that day or the next day. And then I step back. I let it all sink in. And, you know, I kind of, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking about what they said, how they said it. It's a lot of intuition. A lot of what we do is intuition, you know, because somebody's saying one thing, but they're showing us something else. And we have to interpret how much do they want this other thing that they're showing us, even though they're saying something else. So I'm thinking about it. And then I go back a few days later and I then start putting it together. So that's what we call our vision. We present the vision. I've narrowed down the photographs to about three to five of our favorites. I start working on color scheme. Um, I start pulling images of other things that are not necessarily um, interior images. Like maybe it's a scene from a city or maybe it's an outfit or whatever it is but if it represents what we're doing it goes on the board um they usually have a couple keywords that they're talking about so we've written down their keywords sometimes those go on the board um sometimes they have hero pieces i have an example i went to a potential client this week and he had the largest fish tank i've ever seen and he wants it in his new home. So if we decide to work together, that fish tank is going to be front and center on his vision board. So we have to figure out how this thing is going to work in everything else that we're doing. So images, words, colors, hero images, we put all of that together. We have a deck, which is our vision deck, but we also have a one page vision summary. So that is we, what we present to the client. And we keep that top one page on top of all of the rest of our presentations that go out, right? Internally and externally. So as we're designing, we go back to our vision board. If something feels off track, if the client finds something on their own when they were shopping that they really shouldn't be shopping without me, I say, here's your vision board. Does it work? You know, or do you want to change the vision? Because this is what we've agreed on. I find that it's really helpful to keep people on track and it keeps us moving in one direction, you know, throughout the process. And in many projects, we can be working together for two or three years. So yeah, the vision can change slightly, but we need to have a place that we're starting from and an idea of what we're going. Um, so that is really how I come up with the vision. Like I said before, the vision could be anywhere. We started to talk about inspiration, right? Um, Soho, Twilight was my inspiration. I'm, obviously been noted, noticing the colors of Twilight my entire life. You know, it's something that has just been in the back of my mind. I walked into that room and I was like, this is it. 
this is where we incorporate Twilight. Um, when I was doing my own home on 10th street, I had recently been traveling and I had like, I want to do a minimal home. I want to do a black and white Scandinavian look, but in a New York way. So that was in the back of my mind. And I was like, this is my home. I can do it, you know? So you're looking at inspiration every day and it's just keeping that, those tidbits of inspiration with you and then merging it with this vision that you're getting from the client. Because again, it's my look, but it's their home. They're coming to me for my look and I'm interpreting what they want in my way. Um, so I think that is really the overall approach to vision, but I'll stop and see if anyone has questions. I'll move on to experience in the home after this, but does anyone have questions about the vision? Um, I believe they will. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I don't think we're gonna go um... I, I'm just seeing if there's anything, uh, you know, just about vision, but maybe we'll just go, you know, um, in, sorry. So um, the questions that came first, then we'll answer that. Yeah, 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 first definitely. Then. Um, so yeah, is there any style apart from minimalism that has a big influence on your work or your way of designing? Well, I really love all, all styles. So I would never say that I, dislike anything. Um, I think as a designer, you can walk into any space and truly appreciate the, the effort and the, the level of detail that has gone into it. Uh, the modern and minimal is just what I prefer to design with. Um, but, you know, there's the art deco stuff that I think is also really fun. Um, I love, you know, Parisian Parisian apartments. I think that the the level of detail on their architecture is just beautiful, especially mixed with modern interiors. So I'm really, I'm a lover of design. So I would never say that I don't like anything. <laughs> okay, the next Great. question is, what was the most uh, surprising wish you have faced until now? And if you thought it would not have been a good idea to imply a man, how did how did you come convinced 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 the client about a different, more effective solution? What was the most complicated project? Um, it says. That what was the most surprising wish you have faced mm -hmm. until now? So. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, so, so on the client's part. So what was the... Um, I am a little strange in that I like to paint brick walls white. I know that some people hate that. Um, and it is something that is very controversial. But for me... Um, if we're doing a warm, bright white space and there's a red brick wall, it definitely takes away. There are, of course, many, many instances where that works. I have had to convince clients to paint brick walls many times, two of which was a struggle. Um, because we ask the same, it's the same questions that I think people that are against painting the brick, you know, ask is, you know, what about the integrity of the home? How can we remove the paint if we want to resell it? Or, you know, is this the right thing to do? And what color white? Uh, it definitely takes a lot of handholding and a lot of um, persuasion. And if ultimately the client doesn't want to do it, that is up to them. You know, um, I've learned painfully learned over the years that although this is my baby, this is their home. So I have to let go <laughs> a little bit of like the decisions, but we do things like, you know, little mock-ups in Photoshop to show them the difference. Sometimes we'll do 3D renderings to show them um, the two ways it's going to look. And I think a lot of the time, in addition to the, the moral question of should we paint brick it's is it going to look good and what am i doing with my life so i think that the mock-ups really help um but for some reason painting brick there's a lot of brick in manhattan um and even out east in the hamptons and that is a big thing for us 
Okay, um, the next question, I think um, people, you know, upload the questions. So it's, it's great that you, you can, you know, show which one you find interesting because I, I'm pretty sure we won't have time for all the questions. So, so make sure to, to upload the ones that are interesting. Edith is asking, uh, what are your deadlines for an average family house? So three bedrooms, living room, kitchen, bathrooms. How much do you need for planning from the interview to the implementation? Um, I think decorative and got renovations or new construction is different, but for decorative, looking at this again, three bedrooms, we would need without any hiccups, three to four months to plan for decorative, you know, um, I'm including, let's say three months if we're not doing decorative, if we're doing construction, if we're doing a new kitchen, we're doing new bathrooms. That can take even longer. Um, we can probably get it done in four months if we have you know, nothing else on the radar, if we're slow in other projects, but it also, there's just a, a, a variety of factors, right? Um, is there an architect involved? Are we coordinating with them? You know, How are we getting pricing? In, I don't know how it works over there, but here we need permits for everything. So you know, how long does it take to get permits from the city, from, your town from the building from the building if it's you know an apartment, um, but for me planning process is three to four months. Um, in addition to other people's factors that can prolong that. Okay, perfect. Um, Ilda is asking, hi Tina, super presentation, really enjoying it. A question. Uh, does it happen often that the client is not fully satisfied with the outcome of the work and it needs adjustments? That's one question and then I'll ask the second one. Um, it does not happen often because, because we're presenting our vision at the front of the project. I think we take, okay, I really thought that I ended this, you guys. I'm sorry, can you hear that? I'm having all kinds of things today, guys. Just ignore it. <laughs> Fanny knows that I'm like the worst technology person in the world. So, <laughs> so power through this. Guys, I'm terribly sorry. It's fine. <laughs> it's really not fine. But um, but at least we can see so, a bit of your day as, a, as you know, working. And we can see how it goes. I did turn off notifications. Um, so tell me the question again. This was. Uh, it was, uh, has it ever happened that uh, a client was not fully satisfied? Okay, so yes, there are obviously instances where people are not satisfied with things. We do a very thorough job on the front end with our vision. And I think that that helps everybody understand what we're striving towards. Um, so that there's less issues on the back end. If for some reason the vision changed or the client changed and didn't tell us that they no longer like the vision, that's when the issues occur. So now if we have any issues, typically it's with one particular piece instead of the room as a whole, because we have made it very clear on what the room is going to look like, what elements we need to achieve this look. You know, they get to see and touch everything. They see the carpets and the rugs and the furniture fabrics. So they're very well aware of everything before anything is purchased. And we don't purchase until we've designed the room completely, even to the point where we throw in a couple mini accessories to kind of elevate it, then we purchase. And then we install all at one time. So I think that that is really helpful for the client to see it at one time. If you see like the rug, then the sofa, then the chair, you're never happy because you don't understand what it looks like. So yes, there have been instances where they say, I don't really love that coffee table. It doesn't look like what I thought it was gonna look like, but it's not where, oh my God, this room is not what I wanted, you know? So thankfully, we're not there. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Okay, so next question. Okay. <clears throat> what would be your uh, tips for a new and interior designers? For young interior designers? Um, yeah. Experience. I would say um, when I was in design school, I made it um, my mission to 
get as many internships as possible because I wanted to learn um, every different type of design and design office. Did I want to work in a big office or a small office or residential or commercial? So I really made it a point to do a lot of that um, and go to all the trade shows. I mean, I know, you know, it's a little hard right now, but everybody's doing things virtually. You have to see things, you know, you can't just shop online. So you have to see how furniture is made and how they're put together and what do the pulls feel like and go to construction sites when you can and understand how things are actually made. Um, I think that experience is not something that you get in school. So whether you decide to go to school or not, pros and cons of both, but the knowledge and the experience is what will get you through and make you a better designer. So that is definitely my advice. Great. Um, so what if we turn to the third part of the, of the uh, event and then we'll answer the rest of the questions later on. Is that okay? Um, what is the third part of what I'm saying? No. Yeah, yeah the experience part. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> um, so I think I started to touch upon experiences throughout this talk. Um, and there's different types of experiences. There's your experience working with an interior designer, and then there's your experience in the finished space. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the experience in the finished space. Um, I think that many uh, young designers or, or people in general forget that walking into a home should em emote a feeling, right? That's, that's why I got into this. I wanted you to be excited about something or feel something, feel at peace, feel pumped, feel, you know, something, right? You, every space should be an experience. So I have kind of broken it down by the senses. Obviously we're not using taste as a sense because unless you're serving muffins in your home, we're gonna ignore that one. Um, so sight, Obviously that's, you know, the main, the main sense that we have here when we're walking into a space. I really like to make sure that each angle of the space has its own viewpoint. So if you're sitting in a sofa, what are you seeing over here versus what are you seeing over here? If you're sitting on the chair, what else is happening around you? You know, I want every point in the home to have its own interesting thing. So you're constantly surprised and amazed. Um, another thing about sight uh, is the lighting that I know people talk about. I definitely talk about it a lot. Um, and it's a hard thing to master for sure. I think that you have to plan your lighting while you're planning your interiors. I definitely do that. So I am figuring out where the, the ceiling lights are. Is it a chandelier or a pendant? I'm planning my wall sconces. I'm planning my floor lamps and my table lamps. I really like to have different points of lights throughout the room. So no matter where you're sitting, you might have like a moodier light in the chair and a more grand light over the dining table. And I like to have all of these on dimmers so you can change the experience and the mood for different things, right? You're hosting a dinner party. We're going to dim the rest and maybe brighten the dining table. We're having a cool party where people are walking around. Everything's dimmed, you know? Um, but it's because you're dimming at different points that when you walk in, the pools of lights are very exciting. So that's for sight. That I think it's, it's kind of a given, but I think it was worth repeating um, just in case you haven't thought about it. That's the main sense. Um, the next I think is touch. So we all talk about layering. Layering textures is so important. And whether you're using patterns or not, I'm not the biggest pattern person. It is the texture of a fabric, the texture of whatever the surface is. Is it a stone table, a wood table, um, a, a glass table, a you know resin table? Uh, what's going on on your walls? Like I showed you that concrete fireplace wall, that was an amazing texture. Um, textures in your arts. So don't forget about, in addition to your rugs and your window treatments, sometimes you can have photography, which is like a flat texture. You can have 
textile art, which even if you don't touch it, you can see the texture coming out at you. Um, a mixed media art is very textural. Painting, what kind of paint is it? Sometimes when you have those acrylics, it like comes out a little bit. Texture is so important. Touch is so important to experiencing a room. Um, and again, this is not like, I'm not sharing anything completely new. I think it's just something that needs to be thought about, right? None of this stuff is groundbreaking, but I think that as you're designing, if you learn to think in those ways, it really changes how you approach each, each item. Um, scent, I'm a little bit of a candle hoarder. Um, I think most designers are. I love scents in my home. I have a couple signature scents that I go to. Um, but after you intimately know your clients through this discovery meeting, you also understand what scents they like, you know, are they like a musky foresty person or do they like the light florals? And if they like both, what scent goes in what rooms? So when I accessorize, I'm always adding scents to the rooms so that they have it there for when they entertain and each scent is going to be different, right? Like, are, do we have one scent throughout the entire house or do we have the scent to match the room? Um, and then the last one is really, and you, of course, candles, but there's incense and there's diffusers and there's all kinds of things. So don't just get, it's not all candles. Um, the last thing is sound. And I kind of think this might be the most important. We discuss sound from the onset of, our, onset of our projects because we usually have an AV vendor um, because we're doing more than just sound. We're doing the televisions and the lighting um, and the thermo thermostat. And are we able to change the temperature from another location? But placing speakers is one of the first things that we do, you know, um, after we've done our floor plan and our lighting plan, we really focus on speakers because I want to make sure that in each space, the sound is great and you can hear the music or television throughout the flow of the house. Um, some people also like music to change as they move room to room. And this is great for when you do the big reveal because you have a scent in each room and you have a sound in each room. And because we've now gotten to know our clients, we uh, can understand what their playlists are and pick their favorite music for our, for our initial walkthrough and make it different in each room. So I think like it's a lot about personalization, but it's a lot about touching on these things. So everything that I've spoken about was much more geared towards private spaces, public spaces. We've done public spaces as well. We've done show house, show houses. We've done, um, you know, tabletop events for charity. And we utilize all of these same elements when we're doing those spaces. But instead of doing it for one particular person, we're following our theme, right? Like that Soho location. So we're picking scents and sounds and and textures to follow those themes. And it's really fun to see how a guest that you've never met before reacts to the, the things that you put out there and what they're attracted to and what they're like, hmm, could have been a different music playlist. Um, but that is the experience. And I mean, this is just, I'm only speaking about the, the experience of when you turn over your home to, to the, the home to the client, but they have to then carry that experience in the home with the rest of their guests. So you're also teaching them how to have that experience and put that on display. So that's my summary of that experience, but I'm happy to chat about it more. Great, okay. Uh, so I think uh, we'll move on to the, to the questions and then, uh, and then we'll have some time to to uh, go through maybe the, the other part of the experience. So that would be great. Uh, okay, so Frantiska asked, how do you stay on top of things? For me as an architect student, time management is the biggest challenge. It's really I hard. Think we can really <laughs> <laughs> um, my first job at the commercial interior design firm, they were very strict about time management. We had to record our time in, I, I don't even know, 
I do 15 minute increments right now. I think it was even less than that. I think we were maybe doing six minute increments. I can't remember at this point, but being forced to record your time in small increments really helps you understand at the end of the day, how much you've accomplished or have not accomplished. Uh, and we bill for time. So I still track my time diligently. Um, managing my time. I like to do time blocking. So throughout the week I have in my calendar from like the week before hours that I'm going to work on certain clients. So it gives me the time to work on their work because otherwise you're going to be putting out fires all day long. So pre-scheduling the client work time um, and, man and tracking the time has been really helpful. And then at the end of the month, I try to, when I have time, analyze how many hours I've used and how many hours I've wasted. And it's a hard thing to see how, when you've seen how much time you've wasted, but it helps with the next month. Cause at least the first week you kind of start off geared up to like kill it. So I think that's really, it's really helpful. Great. Okay. Next question. Okay. Next question is, uh, Rina ask, what would be your dream project? Dream project. Oh, wow. um, I really love uh, new construction projects. So I would love the opportunity to do more of those. Um, I'd love to just continue to do them out of state. I have plenty of projects in, in the New York, New Jersey area, um, but I'd love to continue to do more homes in LA and more homes in Florida. I think for me, that's fun. You know, it's oh, really fun. And I okay. love traveling, so <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, next one, maybe this one. Okay, uh, next question is uh, Sylvie. Hi, Tina. I would be just curious how COVID situation affects your projects and the daily work. Yeah. Um, we're pretty much back to working. I mean, New York shut down early. We shut down in mid-March, so most of my projects stopped. Um, there was one project that we had recently ripped out her kitchen the week before. So we could not stop. The poor woman did not have a full kitchen until August. Um, so that was difficult, but everything else stopped. And then around July, August, it started to pick up slowly. And now we're back in full swing. We're working, you know, um, construction is going on in this tri-state area, uh, we're obviously being careful. Um, we're doing as much remote as we can. Like I said, we're doing our Zoom meetings with clients if we don't have to be on site. Um, but when we are on site, everybody's careful, we're wearing masks, you know, sanitizing. Um, and everybody has to fill out their COVID forms. We all have to get our temperature taken when we enter buildings, but it's kind of a weird new normal. Um, and so we're pushing through. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, okay, uh, another question from CLV. Hi, I would like to ask, how do you handle the situation when a client asks and insists something that you really don't like, color, material, furniture, lamp, and so on? What is your strategy to, to what is your strategy to, well, strategy to balance the look? Okay. <laughs> so uh, I think I had mentioned earlier that I've learned to let go of the projects a little bit. Um, it's so hard because I put so much of myself in every project, um, but I've had to part with this a little bit and say, I'm going to give you like 150% of myself, but if you are not there, that's on you. So I can only advise you, right? I will tell you honestly, when I don't like something, I don't sugarcoat it. It's very clear. This is the wrong decision. This is the wrong color. This is the wrong size. This is the wrong whatever. And I explain to them why. Um, of course, sometimes with color, it's hard because it's like how I see color. So I can say to them, like, as a trained in, trained designer with my experience, I don't have a scientific reason, but this is not correct, you know. <laughs> but I tell them honestly, and then if they really feel like they want to go for it it's their home, you know, it, it sucks and I don't like it, but I just have to 
you know, let them do what they want. Um, it's all in writing. So there's a lot of backup. So no one can blame me for it, but it is what it is. Great. And I think we have time for one more question. Uh, and that was asked by Lucy, um, who said that you have talked about color, layer and shape, uh, but can you talk a little more about uh, shape and geometry in your art selections and furnishings? In my art selections and furnishings. Um, hmm, I don't know how to address this. I think each space calls for a different shape, right? Mm -hmm. Like each, you know, I do when I, let's say a living room, I do a couple layouts. There's obviously, there's usually one that stands out as the right layout. Um, but I do offer the options to my clients, but the space dictates how the furniture will be set up. And then we can work on, is the sofa more rounded based on the client preferences? And then we try to balance the shapes together, right? Like if we're having a rounded sofa and then a rounded coffee table, we need more square things because you don't want it to look like one big weird round puffy space. Um, so again, it's a lot of intuition, but it's a lot of like pairing things together and seeing if they work or not. Um, and then in terms of art, I like the art to follow what we're doing in the interiors. I don't want it to match, but if we have curves in our, in our furniture, then we, I'm going to look for art that has a little bit of curves too. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but it is, it is a lot of what the space dictates because you have to look at the architecture. It's not just furniture. Makes sense. Okay, so we have actually one last question. Yes, <laughs> the last question is, uh, <laughs> what did you like about this event and why did you accept uh, this invitation? Oh, well, obviously I fell in love with Benny and Norbert. They were like amazing and they were so fun to talk to. But um, I think you had messaged me the previous uh, master designers talk and I and I watched it and I was just like I said in the beginning I like learning about things and I learned so much and it was so interesting and um I personally live in this world where I just design and design and I I think I even said to you guys like I'm not sure what you want from me I don't know what I can say to you but I'll tell you everything I know you know <laughs> if somebody can take away something from what I have to say then that's you know, great, you know, why not? I, I think everybody should be sharing their approach to design and their approach to the world. And we all help each other grow and we help build each other up. So I think what you're doing here is really interesting. And it's hard in these times when we can't go to live events to stay inspired. Um, so that's really why I participated. I thought it was really cool. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> it was so great to hear your <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank okay. you. <laughs> I think we're uh, we're reaching the the end of, of our event, and we are so grateful for you, Tina, for for being here with us and giving this awesome presentation. It was oh, it was spot on. I'm sorry about my weird technical difficulties, guys. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Things come up, and this is I think this is uh, the past few months for everybody. We need to adjust. We need to move over. <laughs> So thank you so much. I, I do have uh, some some last uh, notes on, on actually our, our next event, which will be in February, and we're so looking forward to it. It will be February the 18th, so make sure to put that in your calendars already. And uh, I just want to, you know, introduce our, our next guest a little bit. Um, I made... Um, just you know, uh, a little visual representation. So I'm going to share that with you. I know it's not the best uh, way to show it, but uh, I think you can you can see it because our next um, guest will actually be Francesco Librizzi, and we're so 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 excited that that he will be joining us. Uh, he's an architect and a designer from Milan, Italy, um, and he's actually. Um, uh, he established his own studio in 2006 and works in interior and, and exhibition and product design. You can actually see one of his uh, very famous uh, 
uh, stairs design. Yeah. So I think it's just amazing to see what what he um, has to has to show you guys. He's the art director of one of the most well known. Um, and design driven lighting company Fontana Arte, and he uh, he established uh, by the design in uh, yeah the Giaponti mm. icon in the fifties. He is also um, a professor in Domus Academy in Milan and uh, in the University of, of G Genoa. Um, he will be talking mainly about how to get inspiration of of multi multidisciplinary fields, for example, architecture, design, fine art, and music. Um, so, yeah, he will be showing his exciting projects with you, like like his artistic stairs and and exhibitions, places, and furniture, and so on. So, I think uh, it will be a fun and exciting event, and I hope that we'll see you guys there as well. Um, what I um, yeah, I would like to uh, give a big shout out to our media team, to uh, Zoli, who is right uh, behind the cameras. Much. He's amazing at what he's doing, and uh, and uh, we thank all the trailers and all the cameras that are for him. So thank you so much. And I would also like to make a shout out to to Lucy, who who helped us setting up with all the all the sound equipment, and and we're so grateful for you guys because we couldn't do it without you. So thank you so much. <laughs> And yeah, I think that's the <laughs> end of our little event. There will be a survey at the end that, that you'll see. So please fill it out. We, would be, we are really interested in what you uh, have to say about the event, what we can do, uh, what we can make better, what, what you like and so on. So, so feel free to be honest. Uh, and, and we're really, really, really looking forward to, to hearing your opinions. And yeah, we just, we just want to thank you <laughs> for being here. Thank you so us. much for being here. Yeah. And have a and good see, night. Yeah, have yes. a good night and see you in February. <laughs> yeah, it's coming soon. Bye, everyone. Bye, ciao. Bye,